Hey, welcome back. Well, uh, uh, we just got back last night, Canada. and my partner is exhausted. So and I said, you'll be proud of me. I said, I'm going to church. <laughs> she said, oh, why don't you stay? No. <laughs> I'm so glad now you guys are back. Thank you. Give her a big hug, okay? She's fine. Makes no difference if you are a child like me 
for a king upon a throne, for there are no exceptions. We all stand in line. Everybody needs a friend. Even when I turn away, he cares for me. His love no one can shake. Even as I walk away, he is by my side with every breath I take. And sometimes I'm not his friend, but he is always mine. He's my forever friend, my leave me never friend. From darkest night to rainbow's end, he's my forever friend. If you still don't know the one I'm talking of, I think it's time you knew. Long ago and far away upon a cross, my friend died for you. So if you'd like to meet him and don't know what to do, ask my friend into your heart and he'll be your friend too. We thank the Heavenly Father for your love and guidance. May you, we always honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please join with me and sing our first hymn, Nothing is Impossible. people 
princes and all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers heaven and earth. He has raised up a horn for his people, resulting in praise for all his faithful ones to the Israelites, the people close to him. Hallelujah. Please join with me and sing our next hymn, one of my all-time favorites, Holy, Holy, Holy.
doxology. <clears throat> today because I got ahead of myself when I sent Abby the sermon title. That's really for next week, so you're queued up for next week. We're going to do a, a review of the whole Lord's Prayer next Sunday. We're going to start from Our Father and go all the way 
to, you know, your kingdom. And so that benediction that we're going to be talking about today, the doxology. And so when we think about prayer, Jesus helps us understand how to, how to finish this thing off today when he says these words, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The dictionary defines doxology in one of two ways. It's a hymn or form of words containing an ascription of praise to God. Or it's the metrical formula beginning the doxology that we sing every week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some observations from this, this phrase right here. Do some observations, and then we're going to make some practical uh, conclusions on this. And then we're going, to, we're going to slightly modify reciting the Lord's Prayer today. It's just a slight modification, and I think you'll like it. Because we'll be, we'll be repeating and imitating long-standing church tradition from the first century. Maybe probably the second century. And so um, I, I want to get in touch with the roots of our our brothers and sisters in Christ from the second century AD of how they would recite this doc, this whole Lord's Prayer. Fair enough? Yes. All right, good. So first of all, let's look at some observations here. Number one, doxologies are found throughout Scripture. I don't know if you knew that. But last night I went through just briefly, and I found in the New Testament, or just in the New Testament alone, over 25 different forms of doxologies that the Apostle Paul and other writers of the New Testament had. For example, this one that we have here. Uh, this one's found in the Old Testament, and David writes this. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. This doxology was given at the presentation of Solomon as taking over the, as the new king when David was dying. And they installed Solomon as the new king. But this is David giving this wonderful doxology. He knew his life was ending. He was giving all the credit to God, and now they're installing his son as the new king, and he recites this wonderful doxology. The, the, the psalm that Grace read this morning is another beautiful doxology. From everything, from creeping and crawling things to the heavenly hosts, may everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so we find out that doxologies are found throughout Scripture, everywhere we go, right? But the second thing we observe is that doxologies are an appropriate response to God's saving work in our lives. Revelation 1 says this, To him who loved us, loves us, and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom. God has made you a kingdom. I wish we had time to unpack that one for a while. Priest to his holy God and Father. You are a royal priesthood. Did you know that? Oh, this is a great image of the New Testament church. We are a royal priesthood to God. That's how much he thinks of us. We'll get to that in a minute. We are priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. He saved us to make us a kingdom of priests. Love it. Second Timothy, Paul says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. He was being persecuted on every side. He was waiting to be beheaded when he wrote this. 
He was in prison, and he knew the ultimate outcome was for him to be beheaded. And he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Talk about salvation. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Doxologies are, word, are, are expressions of our faith when we want to celebrate and announce to God how appreciative we are of his salvation. So we're going to review again. Number one, doxologies are found throughout Scripture. Doxologies are an appropriate response to his saving work. And thirdly, doxolo this doxology that we're studying today highlights the majesty of our great God. We're going to go back to this one. For yours is the kingdom. It highlights his majesty. It's his kingdom. It's his glory. It's his power. And he is majestic. Unlike any other. The psalmist puts it this way. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Yeah, growing up in my Baptist church, that was not favored, right? Can't say that. No, I'm just kidding. Praise him, praise him with string, praise him with string instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Can you imagine what this must have been like? David says, use any instrument that you can imagine. Any instrument that's out there, use it for the glory and praise of God. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. These are the observations of what it means when it comes to doxology. Number one, they're, they're throughout Scripture. Number two, they're proper responses to his salvation. And number three, this doxology in and of itself praises the majesty and the glory of our great God. These are all proper responses to when we think about God and proper responses when we want to finish our prayers. Thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you for how much you love us. Thank you for your majesty. Prop appropriate responses or and finishes to our prayer. So let's look at some things that might be a little bit more practical here. Let's look at this individually. Yours is the kingdom. What does he mean by this? Yours is the kingdom. Well, if there's a kingdom, then he's the king. Right? He's the king. This gives us our identity. Our identity in what? Mm -hmm. If he's the king and we're part of his kingdom, that makes up our identity. We are a kingdom of priests, as I've mentioned it to you before. But Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus puts it this way. If you are born again and have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. This applies to you. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. Now, Jesus was questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look here, it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in you. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the kingdom of God comes and lives within us. Well, what exactly is the kingdom of God? What is that? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul answers that question in Romans chapter 14. He says this in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul puts it this way, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That is the kingdom of God. And if you know Christ is your Savior, that kingdom lives and resides in you. That is your identity. Not who you were. Your identity is made up of Christ. Because Christ lives within you. 
That's your identity. So when we pray, yours is the kingdom, we're giving him the glory, but we're also saying, this is part of my identity in Christ. But there's also, yours is the power, Lord. And in case we ever doubt, God has all the authority to answer our prayers. When we pray and are finishing up our prayers, and we say, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, we're saying, God, you have the ability to answer all these prayers, and I believe that. And I am amening that. You have the power to do it. I don't, but you do. We just got done singing what? Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Yours is the power, Lord. In Matthew 11, Jesus says this. Matthew 11, the power of God resonates like this in Matthew 18, Matthew 28. He says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. All authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Our purpose is clear. When he has said, all power is given unto me, that power is then transferred to us to complete his mission. And as we've talked about in the beginning, if you come here early, you'll see our mission statement that we are a bridge for each individual person here at Sagewood. And then on that bridge, they meet us. And they touch us. And we are giving them an encounter with the living God. Because the kingdom of God resides in you. And as we cross that bridge together, it is our responsibility to take that power that God's given to us and to share it with our fellow traveler here at Sagewood so that every home is exposed to the person of Jesus Christ at Sagewood. What a tremendous responsibility, but even better, what a great power that God has given to us to do this. So when we finish our prayers and we say, Lord, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, we're agreeing with God that he has the power to live through us to complete his purpose and his mission. Through us. And finally, yours is the glory. You know, number one, Isaiah 42, 8 says, God doesn't share his glory with anyone. But yet in the New Testament, Paul writes that the glory that we will obtain as a result of our suffering, is not even worthy to be compared. In other words, he says, we think our suffering's big and it's a heavy burden to bear, but it, has, it cannot come close to the weight of glory that will be revealed to us when we get to heaven. It's hard for us to grasp that because all we have anything to compare with is what's going on in our lives right now. And that feels like a ton of bricks. But the glory that will be there. You think of our loved ones that have gone on before us that are in heaven. I think of my grandparents. I think of some of my aunts and uncles. I think of friends who are there. And I think, what must that glory be like? That it outweighs any form of suffering here on earth. It has got to be incredible. It's only stuff that I can imagine, as the song says. But the point is, it will outweigh any suffering that we have today. I like how Paul puts it in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, 13. When we think about God's glory, it, it should bring us hope. Hope because we know that this world is temporary. Hope because we know that there is a life after this one that will go on and on forever and ever. And our bodies will be free of our illnesses, our arthritis that I have. Right? And those aches and pains in our joints. The diseases that attack our brains or our bodies and other forms. That'll all be removed. And there's a day coming where we'll exchange this body for a body just like Christ. And Paul wraps it up this way in Titus 2. He says, We are looking for the blessed hope and the, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The blessed hope. That's
that's what we're waiting for. So when we end our prayers and we say, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Now we're saying, our hope is to be with you one day, Lord. You're going to get all the glory when we're there. We're going to be singing praises to you, but you are going to reward us for our faithfulness here. And we will have a glory too. But more importantly, Lord, our lives will go on after we end our life here. And for that, we now have hope. With the kingdom, we have our identity. With the power, we have our purpose. And with the glory, we now have hope. All in this great doxology that God has given to us, which leads to our wonderful big idea today. You know, awkward endings to prayers. Are, oh, there we go. Awkward ending to prayers are eliminated by praising the one who alone answers. When we focus on the fact that God is the only one that will ever answer our prayers, it's easy to end our prayers then, isn't it? The awkwardness goes away, and the beauty of our, our praise to Him comes forth. Comes forth. So here's two takeaways. Number one is Jesus' invitation to you if you do not have Christ in your life, if you've never trusted in the person of Christ, I love the way Sandy started the service today. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. He hung on the cross for you and for me. When we were born in this world, we were all born sinners. And you know what? That's part of God's grace. Because it puts us all in the same boat. It puts us all on the same level. And the beautiful thing is, God provides one simple solution. And it cost him everything. It cost him his life. He shed his blood for you and me. And his invitation is simply this, come to me. I will give you rest. I'll take away your sin and I'll give you my perfection, my righteousness. And I will fill you with the kingdom of God. I will give you my Holy Spirit and you will have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, love like you've never experienced before. God longs to show you his incredible love. But it's like a present under the tree at Christmas. you got to open it up. You've got to receive it. You have to accept it. Jesus says, come to me, believe in me, that I died for you, I rose again the third day, and I ascended to heaven. That's why we're here today on Pentecost. It represents the day Christ ascended back to heaven, where he is sitting on the right hand throne of God. With all power, with all authority. And he longs for you to believe in him. Right where you're at, you can accept him. By saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. You rose again. And you can save me. Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Second invitation, which is where all we're going to come in. And that's the church tradition. When they recited the Lord's Prayer, they went through everything. And then when they got to this doxology, for thine is the kingdom, the whole congregation would go silent. And the worship leader would go, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And then we would all come back in and use and go with a strong amen. Right? And I thought, you know, that would be a neat thing to do today. Just to turn it up a little bit. To really help us focus on this wonderful prayer that we've been studying now is when we get to that portion, can we do that? Can we try that today? Is when we get to that, I'll lead the portion of the doxology and then we'll all come back in with the hearty, strong, amen. That sound good? Yes. You're with me? Yes. Great. And again, we're joining our brothers and sisters in Christ from the second century all the way up to 2019 of doing this. There's nothing wrong with tradition especially when it facilitates our worship. So here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good job, class. Great job. Almost as loud as when you sang. We're going to finish up our worship service. Kelly's going to play for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Thank you for your attention today. May God bless you. Amen. says that he has prepared amazing things for those who love him. I know you love him and the Lord is going to be doing amazing things in your life. Watch, wait, and be on the alert. God loves you and he longs to have a personal relationship. You've never accepted Jesus Christ today's the day. Do that today. Let me pray with you. Father, we lift up each and every person today. May they see the amazing things that you've done in their lives. And Lord, that you will open their eyes to see the amazing things even today. Thank you for this beautiful doxology that ends this wonderful prayer. May we find ways to praise you in so many ways that our prayers just continue throughout our day. Lord, bless the church of God, the family here. And Lord, that you would draw those who don't know you to the person of Jesus Christ. To believe in him because he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Lord, draw those to yourself in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.
I know what the word was. I know what the word was. Yes. I knew there was something I was going to tell you.